Hello there. I uh, um, in, just want to present a modest uh, demonstration of the game Warlords, China in Disarray, 1916 to 1950. See, so you have a picture of uh, a more or less um, modern era uniformed soldier with maybe even a machine gun or a carbine on his back on horseback amidst some Chinese style mountains which evokes what the game is about very nicely um, which you, maybe you don't get quite so much from the map because it's this kind of abstract game it's produced by Panther Games in 1986 I think they were a, an Australian company but the map I really like it it's very colorful and it's very clean and clear and the game itself is essentially like that it's a uh, it's a very sort of uh, clean, simple system, and basically it's about um, diplomacy, um, resources, and then military uh, combat. And the movement and the military combat is very simple. In fact, everything's very simple, um, so it's really about interactions between the um, players, each player representing one of these factions. Now, I have set up here... Um, I'm entering the third turn as a solo playing four factions of the sort of introductory scenario. Um, but before I go on, uh, I'd just like to say what I want to do with this video is first I'm going to speak a bit about the game, uh, the rules and so forth that will give you some background to it. Then I'm going to do a bit of gameplay to show you how the game works in play. Won't take too long doing that. And then finally I'd like to speak about uh, what the game does, um, what I think it's trying to do, and how well or not it does that. So the game um, represents or presents uh, three scenarios and a campaign game. And uh, I'm playing the first scenario, which um, covers the years 1916 to 1925. Then you, you can go from 1926 to 35, 1937 to 1950, or the whole thing which would be a 25 year game. A year is essentially a turn in this game, but it's a bit more than that because each turn has three operations cycles in it. Um, but so, so uh, any either scenario game like this one has four factions in it. You can have up to seven factions such as you do in um, the uh, campaign game. The second scenario could have five or six players or factions and the third scenario offers three. It's not recommended to have more than three factions in it. So you can see you can have between three to seven players in in reality. You could have less, like the seven, the, the uh, campaign game could have six or seven players. It works well either way. Um, the aim of the game is to come out top um, politically, economically and militarily. And the way that is done is that each member of the faction is ranked for each of those things. And then each um, faction takes points for its ranks in that. So say we've got um, the military, uh, this four faction game. If um, the, let me give you the names of the. So we have um, the Sun faction, which are represented by these horses um sorry let me try and because the graphics are quite nice on those counters it doesn't seem to want to hold that there so they're represented by these chinese style horses um if they have um if they come forth politically they will score one point if they come first militarily they will score four points and say they come second economically they will come get uh, three points for that so that would give them four five six, seven eight points um, and you can see the others would all be ranked similar similarly similarly <laughs> so let's see that is uh i can't get that to focus that's really nice okay um but anyway this is you'll see it when you come close up so you've got the sun faction and the horses You've got these purple elephants, which are the Wu. You have, um, oh no, the, sorry, the Sun faction was lions. That was a lion, the red and yellow ones. Then you have green horses, which are the Fengs. 
and you have the Chang who are uh, dragons on a yellow background. Then you also have the um, Chinese Communist Party, the KMT and Japan represented. They are not in this scenario, but obviously they will come in later than in the um, campaign game. So how does the game play? Well, the game comes with four of these handy ready reference cards, which also have a map on the back, the same map as this, just in black and white, um, some tables on it. Um, you also have a, a track over here. So this tracks the year, this tracks whereabouts in the turn you are, this tracks the initiative order, so initiative can change from turn to turn or even from uh, operations within a turn, and then this tracks the political status. So um, a, a, a faction's political status will determine where it sits on the initiative. Uh, political status is adjusted according to um, this schedule, so it's adjusted for control, gaining control, losing control of the province, winning battles, losing battles, um, having your capital displaced. Um, in the first, you know, we don't have cap to worry about capitals. Um, uh, also, and when you declare alliances, each side gains a political point. But if you break an alliance, it costs minus two in like the official declaration segment. If you break it in the middle of a turn, then it costs you three points. So, uh, you can break an alliance and form another one at the same time. So the net effect might only be a minus one with that which has actually happened in this game. So that's how the political status moves. It also moves um, at the end of every operation cycle. If you are in the positive, you move down one. If you're in the negative, you move up one. And if you're in the zero point, you have no change. So every gain you make, you have to get a sizable um, uh, change because your net change will, will go down by one in every cycle it will be adjusted up or down because of that. So everyone tends to gravitate towards zero. Um, if people are tying for their political status, then you just roll to find out where they are on the initiative. Then the last thing to s about that to say, uh, and let me just get a closer up on that just so you get a different visual. Okay, so here, um, this is the handy die that comes with the game. Um, so there's your turn marker. Here's the initiative. So the other thing to say is that these are normally capital capital markers normally on the map marking where your capital is. I'm using them at the moment to represent who's in an alliance. So the game started with um, the Feng and the, I forget the names, but the Feng and the horse, which who are the horses and the elephants, the Wu, joined forces. Then the Feng broke the alliance and joined forces with the Chang. Um, which is where they are at the moment. Um, now, potentially the Chang and the Sun could join forces too, but they haven't so far. Um, when you are in an alliance, if, say, um, these two are in an alliance, you immediately go to the initiative, both operate together. So you operate essentially at the same time, more or less as one um, faction. So you go to the lowest initiative of the alliance. However, there's another changing f point, which is that if you have the highest initiative, you can choose whereabouts you go. So you can bring yourself to the end or go in between um, some other fellows. So you see, when you're at top place, you can either choose to go first or go last, you know, or, 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 in, or in between, obviously. Um, so that's how that works. So generally alliances, are, it's interesting, a bit of a balancing mechanism there because alliances obviously make you stronger, but it will drag you down to the lower initiative. So you might sort of lose an uh, advantage because of that. So now I'll run you uh, through an overview of the turn. Um, let's see if we can get closer up on that. Um, okay, so each turn... Um, as represented um, here, each turn you have what they call a cycle, then they have operations turn, uh, number one, turn three. So you have three operations and a kind of like diplomacy and, and maintenance and resource segment at the top of each turn. So um, in the cycle turn you have the diplomacy phase, so you essentially have 
about 10 minutes it recommends for negotiations and then you have the declarations where you declare those um, uh, any official alliances. Then you have a famine phase. So uh, there's always randomly between one and five famines go on the board and uh, you just mark a province and essentially it means that it has half the production and uh, maybe the sort of support value, the forage value. Uh, then you also have the revolt phase. Again, that's Provinces always happens. Always so. um, have a revolt at the top of every turn. Um, so that's per year. Um, and again, that's just randomly chosen. You, you have a, a cup of chips of every province. You pull one. And that goes into revolt. Essentially, that means that if there's um, a garrison, that is an army. These represent armies in a province it will get fought by that um, revolt. And if the revolt wins, um, the faction army goes and you get one of these minor warlord um, chits come in. Now, um, one thing to note is that the game does not come with these number chits, just comes with chits like this and army chits. And it says on a piece of paper to record the strengths. I started start doing that and that gets a bit tiresome. I've got chits. You can see at a glance like this, and uh, I've hidden the strengths of each army under each of these. A zero represents a ten. If any army goes down to zero strength, it's automatically disbanded. So you, after the famines and the revolts, you then go to um, production phase. First point of production is foreign aid. Now foreign aid is just a, a random roll, and you check um, the number of factions in play, such as four here, you roll the die for each faction and you either get um, 5, 10, 15 or perhaps 20 points of foreign age, aid each. Then you go to the taxation segment. And taxation is basically where you look at each province, you see the revenue That's, it can bring um, in. The revenue it brings in, the non-red number, so the black number, so that would give you three, this would give you two. That one would give you 12. In fact, this one with the famine will give you half, I think, rounded down. Um, so if the um, Chang only had these two, they would get three, four, um, 16 points of revenue plus that um, foreign aid. Uh, then you go to the maintenance segment. So essentially what that means is that every army that you have on the board requires one of those um, revenue points to maintain it or else it must be disbanded. And that's at the top of the year. Um, then you have the bribe segment. So this is where you give money to any player um, who, you know, you were giving them a reward for something they promised to do, something that you would have organized in the negotiation segment of the diplomacy phase and it's deliberately separated out because um oh i don't know why no it's just there because when the money's happening so you might not have enough money at that at that point you get your revenue and then you can pay someone something and it specifically says in the rules that although you pay someone to do something they don't have to do it but obviously in a diplomatic um situation your good word is is your 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 power essentially so you know if people don't trust you because you're always cutting and backstabbing then you're not going to have much diplomatic muscle but you know it's the choice is when to wield that muscle and spend it as it were so um then after the bribe se segment you have forced production and deployment segment which essentially means you decide how if you want to build any new armies each one costs two and then um, what force you're going to put in them so this army has one you could add in any region up to the region's revenue so in this region I could add up to 12 points of army um, not counting the two I spent for a new army uh, so I could sort of put um, you know some nine points of the revenue into there because the maximum points an army can have is ten um, that's not the maximum that this can support, it's just the maximum that you can add in that segment. Um, uh, so that's the production of army and deployment of force into them. Then you move to the first operational turn. Now it begins with an event phase, and event phases are basically things like the Japanese entering play, 
Um, you can have guerrilla forces coming in. They can be converted into, or, or they get sort of controlled by communist forces. You might have, um, you might have a province which has uh, no faction in it. Then you would bring in, without even the need of revolt, a minor warlord. So it's just sort of organizational and effect game effect events happening there but not really happening in what the introductory scenario I'm playing then you go to the initiative phase so you determine that and that was as as I said there depending on people's political points and you know if the first player wants to move down if alliances are affecting them and then you have to adjust this down and these ones up as mentioned earlier and then you go to the first faction operation phase of the first operation turn, which is what I'm about to enter here. So the first faction would be this one. Um, that's Sun, I, I think, in fact, yes, Sun here. So they will take that operation turn and you have a supply segment, a movement segment, and then a combat segment. Supply is essentially um, the fact that this province can, one unit can forage in it. If you forage, you cannot move and you cannot attack, you defend. So I've marked this unit to indicate, um, as a reminder, that he has to move out. So he will forage, then you have to spend a point of revenue on him to move him. Um, if I, or he could stay put. If I don't spend that point of revenue, then he would have to be disbanded. And uh, I think I could put that force into there, or if there's any left over, I would just lose it. Um, so uh, if you spend a point, you can either stay put, as I said, or you could move. So and you can move two spaces, but as soon as you move into an occupied area, you have to stop. So he could say, spend a point, move into there, try and defeat this warlord and gain control of that province. Or he could move two um, spaces from here, his own control province, and then into there, for example, there or whatever. Obviously, you could bribe. You might not have an alliance, but you could bribe or pay um, a faction to allow you to move through, but you'd have to have already organised that at the top of the year. Um, and then if you are in a province with an, an, another force, you um, engage in combat with them. Combat is very simple. Essentially, um, you check your combat uh, terrain effects chart. Um, there's another one here. I should probably just mention that. Essentially, it's one point to move into any province. Uh, it's two points to move into a province that is rough, has rough terrain, such as these marked. And it's also an extra point to move across a mountain border. So some provinces are rough, like this central one, and it's completely surrounded by a mountain border. So it costs three movement points to go in. But as I said, you only have two movement points normally. So how do you get in there? Well, you spend another point of revenue to force march. That would give you three movement points. So it would be possible to do that through normal clear terrain, of course, if you so wished. Um, then the, the, com the only combat effects are for rough terrain, and um, which has a minus one. The mountains don't affect combat. Once you're over, you don't fight in the mountains. You just have to get over them. You, and then uh, the an other thing which affects combat is the combat effectiveness rating. So for the mountain structure scenario, all factions are the same, but otherwise each faction has a different effectiveness rating, you know, depend on how great or, or not they were historically at fighting. And also the minor warlords roll that randomly. And it only ranges from minus one to plus two at maximum could be zero or plus one. That's all on the D6. You roll the D6, you check the result here. So the range is from one, zero to seven. And you have, either have regular combat or if there's guerrilla forces in play, there may be guerrilla combat. Guerrilla combat has between zero and 25%, regular between five and 50%. Then you go down here, you check the number of factors in your army. So say you had six factors and you roll 25%. You check along the percentile here and you see, okay, that's one factor off. The enemy also rolls the defenders. Say they had nine factors and they roll 30%. Then they, that's 30% of their force means three. So that's three off you, the attacker. And so um, both sides roll attacker and defender. So you can have, you know, and if it's not odds based, if 
defender's um, very hefty. He could deal you a heavy blow, but he might be unlucky and deal nothing. You might be lucky and send him out. Because um, uh, say we had moved these in here, um, if the attacker won, then uh, the defender would lose the force and if their um, army goes down to zero, they would disband. Otherwise, they keep what they had and they retreat. Um, and uh, if the attacker loses, he has to retreat back. Or he could retreat to another region, but you know, only one of his own, um, or depending on bribes and so forth. And that, so that is it, the combat. And so then um, you will go to uh, the second faction, has that same supply movement combat segment, and the third, so forth, faction. Once you've run through all the factions, you go to a second one of those turns. So that's only the from the event phase. So, you know, the Japanese could come in, guerrillas could come in, a new warlord could appear. Check initiative, um, adjust initiative down. So you know if if you if you were on zero and you won a one army battle you get plus one but at the end of that um, phase you would go back down to zero so you need really need to get a bit more um, effectiveness uh, you would need to say win a battle and win a province and you would have a net win of plus one at the end of that phase and so you, you do two of those um, turns and then that is the end of a year. Uh, and you advance your year marker. So my um, uh, scenario is going for 10 years up to 1925. And then, as I say, at the end of the game, you count up, you would factor everybody's um, arm, the points in their armies, and determine um, the ranking according to that, factor everybody's resource points on the board as well as in their bank, um, which is on a piece of paper, and then you, you would also um, check everybody's ranking according to political status. And those three are all, all factored equally and uh, totaled up to find the winner. Um, interesting thing is, is that Japan is always considered politically um, number one. For some reason, politically, that's number one. So they get a bonus. And I think it's going to be very interesting. I'm just um, sorry, my phone keeps cutting out. Whenever I move it, I seem to be pressing the button which stops it. Um, so I keep having to, I'm going to, have to splice this together. Um, yeah, I've just got four um, starting factions. And what they essentially represent are factions because at the end of the, um, was it the Hang Dynasty? Um, at the end of the uh, 19th century, um, you basically. Um, had these four factions coming out and um, each province, separate province, had its own warlord. Um, well, its own political leaders and the, each political leader had a, a one or at least warlord with them. And they started to band together and um, join forces to, you know, to try and decide who's going to um, gain overall control of China. So China is in disarray and it is in disarray from 1916 in this game to 1950. Um, now we know that politically the Chinese Communist Party won out on that. They don't come into the game until a bit later. So um, obviously if you're playing a seven player game, some of you are not going to be playing right at the start. And they, they do have suggestions like uh, one of the scenarios, they say um, the person who, the Japanese will also come in later and the person who falls out, who, who, who's knocked out first takes over the Japanese or you work it out a different way if that doesn't happen. So it could be um, quite a long game, although it's fast playing, you can see it's very sort of simple. There's, it's, I think a lot of it is going to be, you don't have huge movements because, um, you, you, you know, you can't move a lot of spaces because every place is really taken up. So um, you're going to find that um, there's a lot of discussion at the beginning of the turn and then just little adjustments, maybe, you know, um, joining together of armies and then one big army move within a year, i.e. a term. And so not huge movements, but a lot of careful thought planning and uh, um, scheming with or without your allies. So as a solo player, it's a very interesting game. 
um, firstly, just to um, sort of dive into this situation through the means of this um, time machine as such. So it, it, it is interesting because, it, you know, it's focusing me in a, in, a, in a way a book might on what was actually happening in China at that time. And it's making me think more about China now and about what sort of decisions and what and why they ha have hung on to their Communist Party and so for so long, perhaps because they came out of this, you know, what they came out of, you had a, a um, dynastic rule for many, many years. And then suddenly you have this chaos, this disarray, and w w makes me think a bit more about how they think, considering what their past has been. 